slew of people. Um, just some really quick housekeeping items before we get started. Please do feel free to continue to jump in this chat. Our panelists can all see it and will respond as they're able to. And we also have Simon representing from ISTE who will help to moderate some of the questions. You'll also notice that there is a question and answer option. Um, so as you think of questions throughout this, you can feel free to pop into there as well. All right, we are going to get started. Thank you again to everyone so much for joining us. Um, I know that this is a really quick 30 minutes and we have people joining from all over the world, different times of day. And we're just really, really honored to have you all here and very excited to have all of our guests. So really quick grounding. Um, the Teachers Guild is a community of professional learning for teachers across the world um, to come together. We're really excited about thinking and acting like designers and finding creative solutions for our students all over the world. Um, we're very proud to partner with ISTE as part of our online collaboration around digital citizenship. And ISTE inspires educators across the world as well to use technology to innovate teaching and learning throughout the world also. So it's been a wonderful collaboration. This is a part of a 10 week design journey where teachers everywhere have been uploading their ideas around a how might we question related to digital citizenship. So uh, the question that we've been exploring is how might we empower students to be better digital citizens, smart, kind, and secure online? So it's a very lofty question <laughs> and a big question. And again, we're really grateful to have a team of experts that have really come together today to help us dig into it a little bit and understand a little more broadly, what a little more deeply, what does digital citizenship mean? Um, so I'd like to just start by introducing our panelists and they'll all give us a little wave <laughs> so you can see who they are. Um, we have Richard Collada joining us, who's the CEO of ISTE and was previously working with Rhode Island um, Department of Innovation. And we also have Leslie Fagan joining us as an instructional technology coach for Griffin Spalding County Schools, where she works with secondary school teachers around integrating um, effective technology integration. And we have Sandy Barnes joining us. As she's an assistant principal at Rancho Buena Vista High School and Vista Unified School District, and works with teachers around using technology to really personalize learning for students. We also have Macy Wolf and Sam Chapman. We're so excited to have student panelists joining us and really anchoring and grounding us in student voice and what it all means. Um, so we're going to jump straight into things and would love to just start off when we think about digital citizenship and we hear this, this phrase very often now today, um, why, why does it feel so important in today's society uh, and schools to, to have this conversation about digital citizenship? And would love, Richard, for you to kick us off. Yeah, so great. Oops, I froze for a second. I'm back. Uh, great question and, and really excited to be here with, with you all. Um, I, I think if I could start by actually pausing and saying what the heck we mean by digital citizenship. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is that we say digital citizenship and, and I go around the country, I visit schools and we say, are you teaching digital citizenship? And often the answer is yes, if we're lucky. And then when you probe and you say, really, what are you teaching? The answers are things like, oh, you know, don't share my password online or like don't post an inappropriate picture uh, that I'll regret. You know, those are all great things. They're not digital citizenship. Um, and, and when digital citizenship becomes a list of don'ts, right, don't post a, a credit card number, don't post a thing that's mean, don't, don't do these things, um, it's not very compelling and it's a sign that you're not actually talking about digital citizenship because digital citizenship is a list of do's. It is do be engaged in your community. It is do make the world a better place through online tools. It is do uh, engage with other people whose viewpoints are different than yours. And so I think that's the first thing that I just want to set up is that it's important that often we just need to, we need to understand that when we're talking about digital citizenship, it is using technology to improve the world around you, to make your community a better place and, uh, and, and to be very thoughtful about how you engage uh, uh, with others. And so, um, let me just kind of throw that out there to start. And then the other part about why is it important to teach this, um, I think it's just critical that we, um, we, 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 sometimes we assume 
that basic skills of how to be a good, effective you know, citizen in a, in a physical space will transition over to a virtual space without any direct conversation about it. And that's just not true. It's sort of like the, you know, you see the, the, the guy like helping the little old lady across the street and then he gets in his car and he's like honking at people and driving them off the road because he's in his car. Sometimes being that person in one channel, when you move over in another channel, you forget the lessons that you learned in the other space. And that's the problem here. We talk about how to be civil and how to debate and how to be reasonable in classroom environments. And then we move over to an online space and all you see is these like, you know, lob lobbing these like hate bombs and these snarky messages because we forget that just because we're in a different channel, those same skills need to kick in. And if we care about, honestly, if we care about having a democracy in the future, it starts with teaching citizenship in the place where most of our interactions are happening nowadays, which is in a virtual space. That's amazing. And I really love that you touched on the relationship between digital citizenship also being related to what it means to be a good citizen in general. Um, I think that's a really, really important distinction to make. Thank you. Um, and Sam, I would love to hear also just from the student perspective, uh, building off of anything Richard said or just your own thoughts, when you hear digital citizenship, what does that mean? And, and what do you think it means to teach that today in, in schools? Well, continuing on what he said, I think that people just assume that everyone's a really good citizen and because that's what you're raised to think is that people are good citizens and that people will always do the right thing when Unfortunately, in today's world, that doesn't, that doesn't happen all the time. And as a student, our, some of our biggest, some people that we learn from the most is old teachers. And maybe not hearing, maybe hearing like things that need to be changed or things from a teacher's perspective versus a teacher's. Sorry, I'm going off of this. Um, as a student standpoint, I personally feel that digital citizenship is something much larger than in the classroom because it relates to the outside community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that. Great, thank you. Um, and hey, just sister, can I just ask a quick question? So Sam and Macy, just while we're on this topic, have you had any conversations in your school about digital citizenship? Is that a conversation that a teacher has had with you at some point along the way? Uh, has it come up at all? Uh, no, not really. We don't really have conversations about it. I know when I heard about this talk that I went and looked back in my emails and I remember kind of glancing over it. And we do get an email like once or twice a month about digital citizenship and I sure most students probably don't never open it um but when i opened it it was kind of talking about like resources and like how you not to steal stuff from google and it's not always you know free or safe to use that stuff in google um but that was kind of about the most exposure we've had with digital citizenship yeah, thanks. That's, that's, that's that idea of like here that, you know, it's don'ts. It very quickly becomes don'ts, right? Anyway, thank you. That's, that's helpful insight. And I think people have a very different, I guess, idea of like, again, they think digital citizenship is a completely different thing when it's, it's the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. That's great. I, I think this, this idea of citizenship as we're talking about what it even means to be a good citizen, I think it's also good to just define what it means when we say in this, in this collaboration, our question of what it means to be smart online and to be kind, kind online and secure online. And would love to hear from you, Leslie, just in your thoughts about what does that even mean? Oh, sorry, Leslie, you're uh, stuck on mute. I can see you're talking. <laughs> All right, got excited there. Um, being safe and secure and kind online means the same thing that it does in person. Just because you're sitting behind the keyboard anonymous, that doesn't give you the right to say ugly things to people. Um, we need to teach our children by modeling. I think I said earlier to the panel, I used to teach English. And in order for me to effectively teach my students, I had to model things for them or for them. So if I'm a parent, I need to model children how to be safe, smart, kind, and secure online and do the same thing in my classroom. And oftentimes we don't see that 
like Sam and Macy said, they're getting emails, you know, trying to reach digital citizenship. That's not, and I'm not criticizing their school, but that's probably not the best way to do it because I know that we have educators in our district who don't read emails, so I can't imagine that students are reading emails on how to, you know, be safe, smart, secure, kind online. But I think that what the point is that we need to get across just because somebody can't see you, that doesn't mean, or that doesn't give you the right to say um, hostile things towards them. You should just be kind because it's the right thing to do. And doing that online, that's the best place. You should be encouraging because you never know what somebody else is going through. Say the wrong thing, but this pushes them over the edge. And that's one of the things that we get across because especially middle school age, that's an awkward time anyway. And if they're online and they're not getting a positive message, that does a lot, you know, towards damaging their self-esteem. Yeah, thank you. Um, Sandy, I, I think also from the administrative perspective, it would be really great to hear your thoughts on this as well. <clears throat> well, I think everyone is right. It starts with being kind, having good citizenship in the real world but then it has to transfer over. So what we do here at Rancho is we teach some of the common sense media lessons and we teach in our freshman seminar class a whole unit on digital citizenship since we started one-to-one -one with our freshmen. And then in the English and social studies classes in sophomore, junior, and senior year, those lessons are followed up on with additional lessons that have to do with the digital footprint or with oversharing or being safe. But we also really try in all of our classes to talk about that. We had two years ago, we wanted to do something more because I was seeing a lot of students with cyberbullying and not even sometimes realizing what they're doing. And so we had our students in the graphic design class, Maisie, create for us posters that would be hung in every classroom in the school, every office in the school, modeled on the before you post think. And so is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring or illegal, depending on which version you go with? Is it necessary? Is it kind? And those questions apply when I'm dealing with kids who are just being mean to each other or creating drama or in a classroom or being online with social media. And so for us, a, a instructional focus is on critical thinking. So we tied our digital citizenship into critical thinking with our think posters. So we have them in every office, every classroom across campus. That's great. One of the things I heard in that is really having the access, making, making those resources really accessible to both teachers and to students. Um, building off of that, I, I, as, as you were talking about these resources, we're living now in, in a society where technology is changing really rapidly. And all of you, I think, reference social media and the impact that has as well on what it means to be in classrooms today. Thinking about what we know about social media and about technology now, what do you imagine digital citizenship might even look like or mean or what that conversation could even look like in 30 years? Um, and would love to hear, um, especially from the student perspective, because you all are living in this age and have grown up Sam and Macy during this phase of rapid innovation at very quick speeds. Um, what, what do you think this might look like in 30 years for you? Oh, look. First of all, to me right now, it's more, it's a task to be a digital citizen because it's all new to everyone. So the idea that you have to be a digital citizen, what does that even mean? What is that, you know, what is that even supposed to look like? Because we don't know is that technology is even new to us in some, in some instances and everybody else above generations don't even, most of them, technology was, you know, new to them in the last 20 or so years. So I see in 30 years more of it changing to a thought process where, they, everyone, you know, they've grown up into it. And so hopefully they see that they can be digital detectives. They can figure out, you know, how to, you know, what a credible source is, what, how to censor stuff. Hopefully in 30 years that they'll be able to grow up in that and know that it's more of a natural thing to be a digital citizen than having to, 
become one like we are having to. Also, to add on to that, I would also like to point out that I think in 30 years, hopefully, there's some type of curriculum that is made for these, for students in particular, just so they grow up, like, knowing how to be a good digital citizen. Because no one, again, it's just, we're like guinea pigs. No one knows what's going to happen. And so if you, when we get this data from what actually happens and we learn, we just, we need to make a curriculum for it. And that curriculum, you teach the students young. So by the time they get older, it'll be a second nature. That was so beautifully said. And I, I really, um, I really appreciate what you were saying, especially around making it something that just feels like second nature. And, and also Macy, to your point of being, um, being critical consumers also of the digital media that, that we receive and the importance of that. Um, that being said, I'd love to hear uh, also from, from Leslie, uh, kind of with a different perspective of being on the ground and teaching and facilitating these technological experiences, what, what do you think it might look like in 30 years, especially for educators? Well, um, actually, Sam, there is a curriculum, and I'm not you know, pitching anything for anybody, but Common Sense Media has a wonderful scope and sequence with activities for children based on their grade level and there's a component for parents. That's what we use in our district. Um, this is the first year that we've made a concerted effort because you know we get money for E-rate funding and you're supposed to teach digital citizenship. So it's out there and it's free and Nearpod also has those lessons. Now having said that, what's it going to look like in 30 years? Just like Macy said, they, there are some things that teenagers don't know how to do on a computer or with technology although they've not been exposed to life without technology. They know how to use it, but not necessarily appropriately. So in 30 years, people in my generation probably may not, because I, although I look 21, I'm not really, we are not going to necessarily be around. So it's going to be much more common. I remember when my father used to tell me that hardly anybody in the neighborhood had a TV. Well, in 30 years, there is, not going to be anybody who does not have access to internet or their access to some cellular device or mobile device or something. So it is going to be secondhand nature to everybody because right now we're just now seeing the effects of things like cyberbullying and well, not just now, but more recently, um, internet fraud, identity theft, things like that are coming are becoming more prevalent as we go on and do a better job of teaching our children once they come to school at five or three, four, five years of age, it's going to be second nature. So when they're getting ready to graduate, they'll know and then they'll share that as they get older and they start having their families. People my age, they're not so, I had, you know, a former student emailed me the other day who works in my district. I'm not good with technology. And I thought that was funny because she's not lived a life without technology. You know, I, I think I just want to jump in here and, and uh, underscore something that Leslie said that I think is really important, which is we often conflate being tech savvy or tech proficient with understanding how to be effective digital citizens. And that's a dangerous place to be in, right? We can't assume because a student or because an adult can use these devices very well, right? That it means that we know how to be civil in an online space, that it know, means that we know how to engage in our community with our government, how to organize people for good. Those are all things that it means to be digital citizenship. And I can know how to use this device and still not know what those skills look like. And, and that's something we gotta really watch out for. We can have people that are incredibly proficient but still don't understand what those skills look like in a, in a virtual space. Yeah, I think that's so important, the distinction between um, pr proficiency and, and application almost, and um, what that distinction looks like. Just as a quick note for all the panelists, I think there's also some good uh, resources that are popping into the chat. Um, and really quickly want to note that we do have about 10 minutes left. Um, so if you have questions that are coming up as you're, you're hearing things, please do jump into the question and answer. Our panelists will see that as well and can have some conversations with you in that space also. I want to make sure we use the best, make the best use of our time left together. 
Um, so as we've been having this conversation, we've really been leaning towards what it looks like for teachers and schools to lead the conversation around digital citizenship. And it seems like there's actually an opportunity and, and a, an opportunity of where we learn is also happens at homes and with parents. So my question is, how might you actually, um, what role should parents play, if any, and, and how should they play a role in the digital citizenship conversation? Uh, would love to hear from you, Sandy, in response to that. I know you do work with parents a lot um, at, in your role as an assistant principal. And I'm also a parent. So in my role as an assistant principal and in anything is it starts at home, just like kids learn when they're three years old to say please and thank you. Kids learn to be respectful. They learn to be kind. And it's not something that can only be taught in my English class or your social studies class or your math class. So I think parents need to be our partners in all of this from the beginning is in kind of like an etiquette, like we have an etiquette with please and thank you, as Richard said, what it looks like in the real world, how do you translate that into the digital world. And we all need to be partners in working together. And I know as the assistant principal, when I have students in my office and I have parents in my office, I'm often sharing resources with parents to help them because they don't know what to do to, you know, their kids are on their phone all the time and they don't want to take it away because they think it's not safe. So all those apps that are out there that allow them to edit what their kids see or to turn it on and off at different times. But I think we need to make them partners. And as Leslie said, and a number of people in the chat, using common sense media is a starting place because they have a lovely scope and sequence with ways of partnering with parents. But then to go beyond that and find additional ways, we're working with our PTSA and our district office to sponsor um, parent evenings where we have experts come in and talk about digital media, digital citizenship, social media, how to keep your kids safe, how to set limits, and all of those things that we're all kind of talking about now. That's great, and, and just building off of that, kind of having an alternative perspective um, for, for the students, when, when you hear that question, do you think that is a conversation that parents should be having with, with their children, with you? And, and what would that conversation or role look like? Well, first off, I'm kind of, I'm going to take a little bit of different approach than what Sandy said. I'm going to take the approach, I think, as a student um, and like learning about digital citizenship and stuff like that, I think parents should have a role to some degree. But I think that's honestly for the students to learn on their own, becoming more responsible, becoming an adult. I think that that's something that the student needs to make a decision for themselves and to kind of learn on their own at, to some degree because that's that's just a huge part of growing up is being able to make these decisions on your own because your parents are going to be there forever and you need to you need to learn how to communicate with your parents if something is wrong and being able to, to have them there but the majority of making the decisions of what you put online and how you talk to other people online that should be just that should be up to you and hopefully you're making the right decision with that I kind of have a, a view that's kind of like Sandy's. Um, I think they should play a role, but in a role of being an example rather than an educator or a teacher, that they should, you know, be able to show on their own, you know, how they use technology, how they portray themselves on, on their digital, you know, sites or whatever, that they should, that example will be hopefully what their child will you see and then know kind of, even if they're doing the wrong thing, hopefully they kid will see that, you know, I shouldn't be doing this or I should be doing this and kind of rather than teaching them how to be a digital citizen, because they probably don't even know themselves, be more of kind of show what they do know through their being example. I think that was really, really beautifully said. So we have about five minutes left. Um, would love to just take a minute. Um, and, and Richard, I think so much of your work has been centered around innovation and technology. And um, I'm wondering, in this space where people do have resources and technology is kind of everywhere, um, what might it look like in a, in a school that doesn't have as much access to technology, having a conversation about digital citizenship? 
what, what, how might that conversation shift? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think, um, unfortunately, sometimes there may be a perception that if you're in a school uh, where there aren't um, school provided devices, uh, that somehow it's like, ah, not our problem, <laughs> right? But there is no school anymore that's not a technology-rich school. Maybe the school's not providing the devices, but, but students got these things in their pockets, especially if they're older schools, junior high and above. And even if they're not, they have access at home uh, largely. And, and I don't mean that to say that we don't have work to do about making sure that all students have access at home and that there's connectivity, but students are growing up in a world where they will have access and there will be important life events that are mediated through technology. And so whether or not we're handing out a school device or not, we need to make sure we're having these conversations about what it means to engage effectively online. In my previous role, you mentioned I used to work in the state of Rhode Island. I was the chief innovation officer for the governor of Rhode Island. And one of the issues that we grappled with was we were moving more and more of our government services to a digital space. Not just how to request help from the state, but even engaging with your elected representative. And so just understanding how to function in a democracy requires some basic understanding of how to use technology uh, for purposes of uh, of being you know, being an effective citizen and um, and functioning in a, in a democracy so those are conversations that we need to have um, I also have to just slip in a, a little rant here while I'm at it which is um, we currently spend about eight billion dollars a year on textbooks so if there are schools that are saying they don't have enough money to provide technology uh, I'd love for you to take a look at your budget and see how much money you're spending on textbooks and maybe just maybe there's a question about whether that's the best return on that investment especially in a digital world where so much is available open source and uh, online for free but all of that online for free stuff only is helpful if it's presented in the context of how do we know what's legit how do we validate resources? How do we know if there's a bias in the view of what we're reading, which of course there is, but if we aren't talking about those things, then we're not preparing our students to thrive in a, in a, in a digital world. Yeah, I think that was uh, beautifully said. I know you framed it as a rant, but it felt, um, <laughs> it was very well said and, and thank you. And, Actually, we have three minutes um, left with the time here, so I kind of want to close with that thought, um, but do want to just take a second um, to address one of the questions that popped in here. I know that Leslie was, uh, was wanting to respond to, um, was if it was from Kathleen Westall, and she's asking, if you're aware that children under 13 are creating social media accounts, how can you address this? And, and was specifically around, um, do you bring it up to the parents or, or contacting the social media platform directly? I know Leslie wanted to respond to that, so just wanted to give her a, a minute to respond. Um, usually I contact the parents directly. I've done some digital student training and spoken with parents, and I have found that the parents help create the accounts for the children. They are okay with their children being on social media because they think that if they're monitoring the account, that their children are safe. Um, I've reported some accounts to places like Facebook, and Facebook generally says, well, they say that they're that old and they are okay with it. So it's something that I've addressed with the parents because I feel like that's something they need to know um, what their children are doing, but the parents know and they are okay with it. Um, personally, my child would not be on social media at that young of age because I don't think it's safe, but I think it's a family decision and you can't go over that. In our district, there are the things that children under 13 aren't supposed to have access to, they don't have access to, and we do monitor everything they do um, when they're on our network. And we're in the process of being able to triangulate what they're doing on social media, even when they are not on our network, they're at home and such, because we're trying to prevent things from being out of hand. children I think I just want to also um, mention something here, which is we, um, we, there's a lot of information that gets sent to parents. Um, I have four kids. The mountains and piles of information that I get from my school, you know, you could like build a skyscraper with it. Um, I've never gotten anything that talks to me about how I should be making decisions 
about what media, what social tools my kids are using and whether they should or shouldn't use them. Well, sure, it's my choice as a parent, but help me out a little bit. What are some questions I should be asking? What are some areas that I could go uh, if I've never heard of something like Common Sense Media or ISTE or other places where, where information is provided? Where could I go to get that? And so it is interesting, I think, as, as schools, and there are some examples of schools that do a great job of this, but by and large, I think schools need to do a much better job of informing parents so that they understand when, you know, uh, Ms. Fagan is saying, hey, you shouldn't be on that tool. It's not like, whoa, we've never even thought about it before, right? Uh, and so we do need to be, be just, just pr preparing parents a bit more to, to have a meaningful conversation with their kids. Yeah, I think it goes back to parents are our partners, not our enemies. <laughs> we need to partner with them from the time their kids start school and, and stay partners with them instead of, you know, letting them drop off but reach out as much as possible to bring them in to work with us. Well, something I wanted to add as a student is ever since I've started uh, high school, there are a lot of social medias that we have to have as students. We have to have a Gmail. We have to have a YouTube account to upload videos for certain uh, assignments. We have Twitters that we make for the little different businesses that we make on campus. So we incorporate social media into this daily life of a high school student. And there are some students that don't have it. And parents, as a, well, I'm not a parent, but there are, there are parents who, I guess, there's, there's so many different social medias between Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, throughout all of those. I mean, you never really know what your student actually has because there's so many different platforms of it. And I think if there's a way that we could, like that the parents could know what their kid is on and monitor them in a way that they don't know. So they feel that little bit of responsibility to make the right choices. I think that that's golden. So that the student feels empowered, but the parent is also watching them in a certain degree. To a certain degree. Thank you. So we are at time um, and I do want to be conscious of everyone taking the time out today, wherever you are in the world, we really appreciate you joining us. Again, to our panelists, we are so honored that we had such an incredible, incredible range of perspective and you all shared so much wisdom. Um, you'll notice in the chat, some people have shared their contact information for those who wanna stay in touch. And we hope that you all will check out the Teachers Guild and ISTE's current collaboration. We have amazing ideas contributed from teachers across the world right now. Um, they're in the process of testing their ideas and building them out further, really designing them. So hop in there, give them some comments, some feedback, and also- and Alicia, real quick, just to jump in, there are some awesome ideas in there. Will you just say again, if people don't know where they can go exactly to find those? Yes, I'll put it in the chat too. Um, you're going to go to teachersguild.org and you just click on the collaborations and it'll take you right there. Thank you, Richard, that's a really good point. Um, and you can jump in and build with people. It's a really great space to collaborate with like-minded people. You all are in this chat having conversations with, with community, with people who have similar perspectives or passion points. And this is a great space to, to build, continue building and continue having the conversation. Um, thank you all so much. I'm going to uh, wrap up the conversation. And again, thank you. Thank you all for being here. And thank you to all of our panelists today. Thank you, Alicia, and thanks for all the great comments, everyone. It's been really, really great conversation. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.